The Spirit of God is here, man. We're in this series. I'm excited to start this new teaching series with you that we're calling the Holy Spirit. And the goal here over the next four weeks, four messages, it's a four-week series, is to introduce you to the person, the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I know even talking about this, this topic and this concept, there's some different thoughts, ideas um, come to mind. And so we're going to address some of those today. Let's go right into the message notes because I really think that this scripture, Acts chapter 19, really sets up where I want to go and take you guys today and throughout this series. But let me set it up for you because um, uh, if you know anything about the Bible, the, the New Testament begins with the first four books we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the, and that's the account of Jesus' life. And we, we, we celebrated Easter last Sunday, which phenomenal experience, man. So many people committed their life to Christ and were touched by that. It was amazing. Thank you for inviting and being inviters that day. But what we celebrated was the resurrection. And we've been talking about death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's at the end of those gospels, okay? The fifth book in the New Testament is this book, the book of Acts. And what's interesting about the book of Acts is that it begins with the Holy Spirit. And then here we are 19 chapters now into the book of Acts, and it's still about the Holy Spirit. Let me show it to you in Acts chapter 19. It says, while Paulus was at Corinth, and that's where we get the book um, Corinthians, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus, and that's where we get the New Testament book Ephesians. He says, there were, some, there were found some disciples. Now, note that with me, that these are Christians, all right? These are believers. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? when you became a believer, and I love their response. They answered, what are you talking about? That's what they said. They said, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And really what's interesting is that that's still the case today. There are so many people who are going to heaven, who know God and love God, and, but who have never experienced the Holy Spirit. And I think there, there are a lot of reasons, but for the most part, the Holy Spirit has gotten a bad rap. I do. I think that the Holy Spirit has gotten a bad rap, and, and we have seen some things, experienced some things, and it's been packaged in a way that maybe we didn't like it, and I know I have too, and it's made some of us afraid, apprehensive, resistant towards all things of the Holy Spirit, and our theology sometimes is not, when it comes to the Holy Spirit especially, is not based upon the Bible, but based upon our experiences, based upon what we've seen, what we heard, or, or maybe what we've seen even on, on TV, and a lot, of, a lot of people, they just don't, they're like, I don't want anything to do with the Holy Ghost, you know? I mean, ghosts scare me. I don't know about you. I don't want anything to do with ghosts either. But there's a, there's a lot of just ideas and things that get associated with the Holy Spirit that simply are not true. So if you've ever, listen, church, if you've ever been committed to a teaching series here at Discovery Church, I'm asking you to be committed to, the, to this four-week series, like three more weeks into this thing, because... Um, I'm going to explain to you the person, not an it, not a thing, not a force, but the person of the Holy Spirit and show you how important he is in your life on earth, that he plays a very important role in your life. And I just think, I believe that if we despookify it, that if we demystify it, that if we maybe get rid of the man-made sensationalism that comes along with it, yet at the same time receiving everything that God has for us, I'm telling you, church, your life would be better. It would, it would, it would just be better, and I want to lead you to that, you guys. And today, my, only, my goal today is just to introduce you to the person of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. And, and, and who he really is, and kind of, uh, and, and honestly, my, my goal today is that you would be comfortable, to get more comfortable with the person of the Holy Spirit. That, that's my goal. And to do it, what I thought I'd do is, um, is to take his name, an understanding of his name. You can tell a lot about God and about people by their name. Their names have meaning, and God's names have meaning. God is called a lot of names, and his names reveal his character. So we have like Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, all these different names that describe God. He's God, our healer. He's God, our banner. It, the name describes the characteristics of him, of God. And so when you get the Holy Spirit, though, you get two different words in, in your English translations that, that most of your Bibles, it either, when you get to that word spirit, it either, either translates it one of two ways, ghost or spirit. 
and in my opinion, that's, that doesn't do it justice, you guys, because the, the original language of your Bibles in, in the Old Testament, it's mostly Hebrew. The New Testament is mostly Greek. And in those, in those languages, the translators that are translating those Hebrew and Greek words into English, they, were at, they had a tough job because there was no one word to describe this God, the Holy Spirit. And so they, they, they chose this word. And, and, and I really think it's, it's been a disservice um, because it's put people off, this ghost language or this spirit language. But so what I want to do is kind of show you what his name is, really is, and then, and then why he's named that. So in your Bible, over 800 times, we have the words holy, we have the word ghost, holy ghost and holy spirit over 800 times. But two language, Hebrew and Greek. So let me give you the Hebrew word for spirit that you get translated spirit or, uh, or ghost first and show you what it means. Write it down this way, that the Hebrew word for spirit or ghost is ruach. Ruach. Now you got to say it like that now. Say it with me. Ruach. Ruach. Come on, you guys can see, speak Hebrew now, all right? If you want to say it right, you got to act like you got a per, popcorn kernel stuck in your throat. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You got to get that thing going on there. Ruach. Okay? All it means, this is what it means. It means a wind. It's not ghost or spirit. Look, a wind. Breath. A violent exhalation or a blast of breath. So now you see why the English translators had some problems and challenges with this word because you because they couldn't just go, you know, okay, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Breath. That don't work, right? That's hard to, to explain God in that way. But we understand his nature a little bit more um, through this word. It's actually used in the second verse in the entire Bible. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, this word ruach shows up. It says, now the earth was formless and empty and darkness hovered over the surface of the deep. And ruach, the, the breath of God, the wind of God that, that had the power to create the whole earth, the whole world was hovering over the waters. And then you get light and creation and all these things. It was, it was the ruach, it was the wind, the breath of God that actually created the world. Okay, and then in your New Testament is the Greek word that we get for Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost is pneuma, pneuma. And again, this means a current of air, a blast of breath, or a strong breeze. So um, because they didn't want to call God breath or air, they just put in these other words. So this word, one of many places it's used in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus talking, he says this in John chapter 6, verse 63, he says, the words I have spoken to you, the, 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 the words, every time I speak, Jesus says, it has the breath of God. It has the wind, a strong breeze in it, and they are life, meaning it brings life to you, meaning that word pneuma means that the words on the pages of your Bible are not just mere words, that they are the breath of God, that, that within those words hold the very power to fulfill the words that are written on them. Amen, church? That it's just not a normal Bible. It's the breath of God. Uh, pneuma is, and, and that's what I want you guys to experience. I want you to experience the breath, the wind, the breeze of God. That's, and, and, and honestly, that, that's what makes your Christianity not so stale or robotic or routine or rote. It was never meant to be that. It was always meant to have life in it. It was always meant to have breath and wind in the sails. It was always meant to give life. Now, in order to understand the Holy Spirit, Ruach, Numa, this breath, wind, blast of air, here's my thought. Why don't we look at the characteristics of wind and see how they parallel to the nature of the Holy Spirit? There's a reason why God wanted to reveal himself as a holy Ruach, as a holy Numa. Amen, church? You guys get this? There's a reason why he chose to reveal himself as a blast of air, as a wind, as a breath. There's a reason. I, it's because it, it describes his characteristics. So let me show you a few ways that wind parallels the characteristics and the nature of God. And, and, and honestly, here's my hope, that you would just get you know, disarmed a little bit, that you would maybe maybe stop resisting as much or that you want to get it, you wouldn't freak you out this topic, but you just get a little bit more comfortable with the person of the Holy Spirit and actually find out that, man, he's good. 
And, and, and if you knew him, you desperately want him in your life. So here, let me, let me give you some characteristics, draw some parallels. Here's the first one. Number one, that wind is unseen. Wind is unseen. So here's what's going to happen. Inside this closed room, it gets kind of, you know, stiff or stale sometimes, but you walk outside and, and, a, and a breeze is going to hit you. You know, you can't see it, but you feel it. And you go, oh. some of you are even going to say it. You're even going to go, oh, that feels good right? And no one's going to, no one's going to think you're a freak or a weirdo for saying that feels good out there. But in here, if someone goes, whew, that feels good. Some people are like, what the heck are you doing, man? What do you, what you mean you feels good? What are you feeling? I didn't, I didn't feel a thing. I had one brother tell me, no, you know, pastor, you're not supposed to go on your feelings now. And man, I understand that you're not supposed to go on. I know, but it sure feels good to feel what you're running on every now and then. Okay. Because honestly, feelings aren't bad. Now, you don't base your Christianity on feelings. No, no, no. We don't do that. But feelings in themselves are not bad. God actually gave them to you. And I believe that God was meant to be felt and experienced, not just studied. Why else would he be called a blast of air, a wind, a breath? Why? Because you can experience him. You can encounter, but it's unseen. It's unseen. In fact, my prayer for you every Sunday Every Sunday, I pray, my prayer for you is that you, wouldn't, that you wouldn't get wowed or amazed or impressed by Discovery Church. I, I, I really don't. I'm not, I'm not wanting, I don't want you to get impressed with our music or our lights or the phenomenal teaching that happens every single week here at Discovery Church. And you shouldn't be laughing right now. I'm taking offense. But you... But it, that's not my, my prayer is that in the middle of it, somewhere like in worship or somewhere in the teaching, that something would just blow over you and you would go, whoa. Wow, God is here. God's here. I mean, that's my prayer, that you would experience God. Let me show you the words of Jesus here in John chapter 14, and let me give you the context of that one too. And I like giving you the context of the Bible sometimes, because I know some of you are new to the Bible, and some of you don't even like reading the Bible because it confuses you or you don't know how to approach it. So let me give you the context of John chapter 14. This was, uh, in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, this is where we get the Last Supper. Okay, so these, this is the last discussions Jesus is having with his disciples before he's going to the cross, before he's, he's taken captive. So Jesus is, is, is telling them, look, I'm about to be taken. I'm going I'm to I'm gonna go to the cross. I'm going to pay for sins. I'm going to pay the debt, and I'm going to die. And you're not going to be with me forever. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to be resurrected, and I'm going to go sit at the right hand of the Father and, I, and I'm going to be making intercession for every prayer you pray. I'm going to make intercession for those things. But I'm not going to be here with you anymore, so I'm going to send you a Holy Spirit. Because I'm not going to be on earth, but he can be with you on earth. Look what Jesus says in John 14, verse 16 and 17. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. And that's an interesting translation. Some of your translations there may say comforter or counselor. But look what his job is. His job isn't to freak you out, Okay. He's here to do what? To help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth he's called. Now watch this. He says, the world cannot accept him. See, the world's going to laugh at this. They, 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 they're they're going to laugh at you. It, that, that's a little freaky to them because they, it neither sees him. See, most people are only comfortable with what they see. What they can see with their eyes and what they can understand with their minds. It says they don't know him. They can't handle this part of God that's felt. See, the world cannot handle this part of God that is unseen nature, that God in his presence. He says the world cannot accept this because they can't see him, and therefore they can never know God. And there's a lot of people going to church and never experiencing the presence of God and the person of the Holy Spirit, and even rejecting it because they can't get it all into their minds. They can't fit it into their understanding. But then he says, but you know him. Well, why do you know him? For he lives in you and will be in you. So you can't see him. Even right now, you can't see him, but you can feel him, can't you, church? He's here. He's here. And that's why a lot of you come. A lot of you come here for that reason. Because you know that you can have a dry and weary, a tough week, but you know if you come in here on Sunday, you can get a breath of fresh air don't you? And that's why I love standing outside and talking to people. And, and I'll, I, I get to, I'll ask questions to people that are new that, hey, how'd you, how'd you, I hope you enjoyed this service. And I can always tell the unchurched people their response to our environment and the presence of God. It's so funny, but you can always tell. There was one dude, literally, I, I was talking about there. I said, man, I hope you enjoyed the service. Uh, and he said, um, oh, 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 yeah, I don't know what happened in there. That's what he said. 
I don't know what happened. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, like I, I hope it was good. I said, I hope it was good, man. He said, oh yeah, yeah, it was. I'll be back. I'll be back next week. And then he, no kidding. He literally said, I'll be back next week. Shoot. But he didn't say shoot. He said the other word. And I was like, heck yeah, man. Come on, bro. That's awesome. We're going to work that out of you, man. You keep coming back. Come on. It was just so cool to see because he couldn't articulate what he was experiencing. And he did come back. And he didn't come back because he was wowed by something. He came back for the presence of God. He could experience it. He couldn't see it. His mind couldn't even understand it. But he knew it breathed on him. Something breathed on him. And I'm telling you, that's available for you every time you worship God. That is available to you. The Holy Spirit. Um, John chapter 14 is a great, the words of Jesus in John chapter 14 here are beautiful. They really are. But he did, God, God made available to you the Holy Spirit. Here's the second aspect of when. Um, and, and really, I'm just trying to get you comfortable with the Holy Spirit. That's all I'm doing. Getting you a little comfortable, seeing that he's not really what maybe they taught you or they told you. Maybe, it's, maybe there's, the Bible has something different to say. Here's the second aspect of when. And that is wind is unpredictable. Wind is unpredictable. Now, a lot of people don't like that about God. <laughs> they like their God all tucked in and proper. You, you know, they, they just, so they don't like this kind of, now, let me set the record straight here because there is a predictable, there are predictable aspects of God. There are. God is predictably good. Amen, church? Like, he's predictably gracious and loving and forgiving. He's predictably powerful to save, man. There, so there are some predictable aspects of, of God, a predictable part of God. Like, he's even called the God of order right? So he created the seasons and harvest time and reaping time and sowing time. And, and so he created your, your, your bodies even, and your bodies are so organized and all the systems that are working so perfectly and beautifully well together to function and keep you healthy and alive on planet earth. Like you have an endocrine system, you have a cardiovascular system, you have, you have a reproductive system. You have, there's so many systems that you have, and God did that. So there is a predictable aspect of God, but can I just tell you that the Holy Spirit does have an unpredictable nature about him. So what do I, what do I mean by that? Let me explain. One time, God spoke through a burning bush. One time, just one time that happened. Thank God Moses didn't do what some people try to do today and start the first church of the burning bush, right? And tell people, oh, no, no, if you think God's speaking to you and it weren't through no burning bush, well, I wasn't God because God speaks through the bush. That's how he spoke to me. Thank goodness. That was one time. You know, one time God even spoke through a donkey, do you guys know that? Thank God he didn't do that for me. I would have been out. You know, my God is too much for me. I'm done. I'm done. I can't go there, God. It freaked me out, but maybe he did it because he's unpredictable. In fact, one time in the Gospels, Jesus, some, a, a man took his friend who was blind to Jesus, and he tells Jesus, hey, Jesus, put your hand on him. Put your hand on his eyes. Do the hand thing. Do the hand trick, Jesus. And Jesus is like, oh, oh, you think... You think it's the, the system of my hand. Oh, and because he asked for him to touch him he, he, with his hand, he didn't. He actually made spit mud and spit in the dude's eyes. I can just, I can picture the friend standing by going, oh my, what are you, what are you doing? I said, your hand, you're going to give him pink eye, Jesus. What are you, what are you doing? And just freaking out because, because you know, why Je you know why Jesus did that? And God will do this in an unpredictable way. Is because he knows that you have a tendency, you and I have a, a tendency to create idols and worship systems instead of him. And if he worked the same way every time, then you would worship the system. Oh, this is the way. This is, no, it's not. You can't. God does not fit in your understanding. God has an unpredictable nature to him. And you just need to know that. No. And I know some of us don't like that part of God, and we like our God all tucked in and orderly, and you just need to know. I mean, if you like your God all orderly and stuff, God will mess you up. He will mess you I'm just telling you, He will. Can I say that to you? Because God doesn't do it the same way every time. And the, although I know there's a predictable nature about God, absolutely, there, there are parts about God that are solid and steadfast and immovable, and we can trust him, but there's also an unpredictable nature of God that, listen, church, that you need to welcome into your life. Welcome it. Like, like embrace it. John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus says this. Jesus answered, the wind, now time out right there, because guess what that word right is right there for wind? 
pneuma. It's the same word that he used for spirit right later in the same verse. So let me read it that way. The pneuma blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going next. So it is with everyone born of the pneuma. Are you catching that? What he's saying is you, it's unpredictable. There is an unpredictable aspect of God. I, I got a, a phone call like a month or so ago from this reporter of a Christian magazine. And, and every now and then, I, uh, often I'll get calls from pastors and other churches, or this time as a reporter of a magazine, they want to know what in the world is going on at Discovery. They're like, what is going on? You guys are growing like a weed. What are you doing? And so this reporter is like, we're going, to do it. we're going to do an article on Discovery Church. We want to know, what are you doing? They, so the guy literally told me, what's the trick? What's the, what's the systems? That's what he even used the language. What's the systems? Now, I know we, we do have systems, and we, we operate, administrate the body of Christ in a very orderly and administrative way. But I knew what he was asking for, and, and, and so I didn't respond the way he thought I would respond. I, I said, can I tell you something? We would not be where we are today without the power and the grace of God operating in Discovery Church. There's not. There are some things that have happened along our journey that there is no way I, you, anyone can take credit for it, but by the power and the grace of God, he made a way. Like, we would not be where we're at. And he was like, he was, he was like, he was amazed at that. He said, it's rare to find a church that is so organized and administrative and efficient, but still embrace the power and the presence of God and the, the power of God. He's like, that's kind of like a hybrid. And I said, I'd like to think so. I would, because God is both orderly and predictable and also powerful and unpredictable, and you need them both, church. You just need to embrace both into your life. Here's the third thing. Wind is powerful. Wind is powerful. It can generate electricity. It can sail a ship, but it can also destroy a city, can't it? You see that on the news. Tornadoes and things. There is this powerful nature of wind. Wind is powerful. Now, listen to me. Some of you guys, listen. You're going through something in your life that, that you cannot fix by your power alone. You can't. You need, you need a power above that. And if you're not going through it right now, there's going to be times in your life where you were never intended to work those problems, those issues, the solutions out with your own strength, that there is a power available to you. And, and, and man, it's just so sad that we would relegate ourselves to, to our own power and what we can handle ourselves, when God has made available to, available to us another power for us. Like there is power available and we resist it because the way it's been packaged to us, the way that some people have turned us off and represented God, the Holy Spirit in a weird way. Can I tell you, God's not weird. People are weird. Okay. You guys know that. Like God's not weird. Just People are weird, and people are going to be weird, you guys. Let's look what the Bible says. Acts chapter 1 and 8 says, But you will receive, say it out loud, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And I say, come on then, Holy Spirit. Come on. Bring it on, because I'm facing some things in my life that I, I don't have the power to fix. I need the power of God. I read a story of a man named Charles Finney who is considered the father, father of modern-day revivalism and um, 19th century attorney and Presbyterian minister. And he got to, by his own testimony, he got to a place in his, in his walk, in his life, where he said he was comfortable in his Christianity. And he said, he said on an intellectual level only. Like on, on, and, and, and by his own like, testimony, in his own words, he said he, that his life was lifeless, comfortable, and, and he said it was hard for him to continue living. And then he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And he said this up here on the one screen we have. Sorry about that. The Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Come on, church, just bring that on. We need that. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love, for I could not express any other way. It seemed like the very breath of God. That's because he is the breath of God. And there's some of you here today, listen, it is mission critical for your marriage, for your job, for your health, for your kids, even even better, even more important, for your faith. 
that you get some wind back into your cells to propel you forward to everything that God has for you. Which leads me to my next aspect of wind, and that is that wind is refreshing. I love that part about the Holy Spirit. He just is, he's refreshing. Now, years ago when we started Discovery Church, we started with a swamp cooler and, the, and, and had to sit through a summer with a swamp cooler. Who's ever had a swamp cooler? Come on, lived in a swamp cooler. You know, in the summer when it's above 100 degrees, there is one cool spot in that house. Right under the swamp cooler, right? It's, it's good right here. You go five feet over there and it's hot as Hades. You get right back in here, it's cool. This is like, the because the, the wind is refreshing. And when you sit under the presence of God, it is refreshing, isn't it? It's like when you get into your hot car in summer and you roll down those windows and you speed on up, just wind blowing through there. It's, ah, oh, that wind is refreshing. The Bible says it this way, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, no eye has seen. You see, if God showed you everything that he wanted for you, your eyes wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. No ear has heard. If your ears heard it, you wouldn't even be able to understand it. He says, no mind has conceived. In fact, your mind can't even hold it. What God has prepared for those who love him. So then how does he get it to you? He's prepared things for you. He's got a plan for you. How does he get it to you? Well, God has revealed it to us by his pneuma. You see, that's how God gets what he's prepared to you, to you. Not through your mind, not through your eyes, not through what you can see or what you can understand, but he gets everything that he has prepared for you into you and through you by his spirit. That's the rule. I mean, I'm just trying to get some comfort, you guys. That's why I'm asking you to let me take you on a four-week journey where you can, your life can just have some wind back in it, where it can have some wind back into your cells. And now listen, I've received some bad advice when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And, and maybe, maybe you have, or maybe it's your own inhibitions and it's kept you to stay away from him and, and keeping yourself from God. But I want you to understand that today. When you, when you, if you're resisting the Holy Spirit like I used to, you're resisting God. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, everybody. He's God. And I know you have your own story to tell about this and how maybe you know, you've, what you've been through and experiences that have kind of put you off. But what I would encourage you to do today is to take a deep breath. That's what I want you. Just take a, take a deep breath. Go ahead and let them into your life, and you'll see just how amazing it could be. In fact, here's how the Bible will tell you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, don't grieve God. Like, don't reject something God has given to you. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit, check it out moving and breathing in you is and can be the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. So how do I do that, Pastor Jason? How do I, how do I take a breath of the Holy Spirit? I'm glad you asked, church. Let me give you three things to start your journey today, okay? Three things to take a here they are. Here they are. Write some notes with me, guys. Number one, take a breath and let go of your fears and misperceptions. That's what I'm asking you to do today. Your fears and misperce misperceptions that aren't based on the Bible, and a lot of us have had some, uh, some of us are, as it relates to the Holy Spirit, fear and misperceptions. I had my own that I had to overcome, and so do you, but what do we do instead? Don't even take my word for it. Just take God's word for it. Like, don't take what I have to say about the Holy Spirit. God will show you through his word, and here's what I'm asking from every one of you is just to take a blank page approach to what God has to say in his word about the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, if you just take a blank page approach and take God at his word, you're going to realize that, that he's not weird or spooky. You're going to realize that he's, he's not bad for you. You're going to realize that everything he has is good for you, and you're going to want every bit of him operating in your life. That's what you're going to discover in a blank page. Proverbs 3 and 5. Let's say these first two words together. Ready? One, two, three. Trust God. That's what I want you to do. God's not against you, you guys. He's not going to have you, you know, if you, if you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, uh-oh, you're going to become some town-to-town -town revivalist. He's going to put you in a hypnotic trance or something. You're going to be, no, God is not going to do that. That's, that's not what he, he does. Trust God. He's good. And what he has for you is good. Trust him from the bottom of your heart. 
But don't try to figure everything out on your own. Like, don't try to fit it in. You can trust God. Here's the second thing. I'm just encouraging you to take a different posture toward the Holy Spirit, and that is go all in. Go all in. It's so easy to become comfortable in our Christianity. And not, there is not a, one, a single person here that has arrived spiritually. That you're in a place now, whoa, or you just, there, there is no one here that has arrived, okay? And that's why I think God wants to continue to stretch us, to stretch our capacity, stretch our faith, stretch our understanding in our comfort level. Koala, I was watching ESPN one night. I do that sometimes to wind down. I'll watch ESPN or NFL Network. I don't know what you guys do wind, unwind, but I'll watch some of that sometimes. And, and, and it must have been a slow sports day because on, on ESPN, they were playing the World Series of Poker. And I'm about you, I'm like, poker ain't a sport, man. What's this? And anyway, I just was, I was unwinding, so I'm watching, I'm watching poker. And, um, and, and it, got in, it got down to like two people, two guys, and, it's the, and, and they, ha, they put all, they got to a point where they put all the chips into the middle of the table, and it was like tens of millions of dollars or something like that. And I'm at the edge of my seat now. I'm like, this just got interesting, man. This is put up or shut up time. This is go big or go home, man. This is, this is all or nothing. And, and I'm just like getting into it, and the announcer's yelling and stuff. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. And I'm like, this is how your relationship with God should be. This is how our, we're, we're supposed to go all in in our relationship with God. Can you imagine what, our, what we could do as a church if every single one of us were all in with God? Like I'm talking about all in spiritually, all in emotionally, all in missionally, all in financially, just not leaving anything back, chips all the way in. There is nothing that we could not accomplish on this earth with God's people all in, all in. So here's my question to you. Have you gone all in with God? Have you shoved all your chips to the middle of the table? Now, it's probably important for me to mention right here that God does, he is against gambling. The Bible does say that, okay? But I just can't think of any better picture than, than yeah, I don't get, I'm going to get crucified or something, okay? But I just can't think of any better picture than God just, than, than us just pushing the chips to the middle of the table. And here's, here's my fear is that some of you are holding out. And because you're holding out, you're missing out. You're missing out. You think, by, you think by keeping some chips to yourself that you're somehow holding some to yourself, but you're missing out. And you'll never, you'll never experience the best of God until you go all in, church. Go all in. Here's what the, once you do that, I'm telling you, you, your life, if you go all in, your life will be radically changed. It will be changed forever. Here's what I know about God. God's not holding out on you. God went all in for you, didn't he? We celebrated yesterday, Easter, when Jesus Christ went all in for every single one of us. He took our sin, our debt. He went to the cross, and he went all in for us. We are called to follow suit and go all in for God, to lay down our life and say, okay, I'm following suit. I am going all in, Jesus. And I think at some point, if you want to understand the power of God and everything that he has for you in this whole Christianity thing and faith thing, and if you want to understand the depth and gravity of that, at some point you're going to have to go, okay, I'll take the bearded bastard crazy guy and just put my chips and see what's going to happen. Okay, there's going to be some time where you got to just go all in. And, and, if, and if, oh, if they say groups is, is where it's at and you're never going to understand God and until you get in community and groups, then okay, fine. I'm going to go. I'm going to put them in. I'm going to go to groups. And if they say serving is not just about, you know, doing stuff at Discovery, but it does something inside of me as I make a difference and God uses me, okay, I'm going to push it in the table. I'm going to be on a team. I'm going to be on all serve. You just go all in. Here's my, here's my challenge to you guys. Just give me the rest of the year. Like the rest of the year, you dedicate your time to much simpler, feeble things. Give God the rest of this year, go all in. Put your chips, all of them, into the middle, middle of the table. And if by the end of the year, you, you won't, if you think by the end of the year that it, your life's not better, okay? And, I, and at the end of the year, if you can't look back and go, okay, I know I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. If, if you can't be able to say that, to say, man, my life was radically changed after going all in. Then, then I'll change churches with you, okay? Because we just need to close the doors because this ain't working, all right? But I'm telling you, that's not going to happen because God responds when you shove those chips to the middle of the table. Look what it says here in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. Don't even take my word for it. Here's God's word. God says, you will seek me and find me only conditionally. There's a condition if you find me. You'll seek me and find me only when you seek me with all your heart. 
You see, you can't, you can't even find me until you give me everything, God says. Like, don't filter God. Go all in. And I know when it comes to the Holy Spirit, church, I filtered. I, didn't, I was afraid of that part. I didn't want to be weird or spooky or goofy. And I saw it operate. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. And I filtered for a long time until I took God's word at his word and, and discovered he's not weird or spooky. He's actually good. He wants to give me power and help. And he wants to walk with me. Man, he's good. And I had a mentor speaking in my life. I said, okay. And I, I remember praying and asking the Holy Spirit, okay, Holy, I, literally, I said, okay, Holy Spirit, you can come in. But I told him, I said, but you better behave yourself. Because I, I better not end up like sister so-and-so. I better not start acting like brother so-and-so. And, and you can imagine God did not answer that prayer at all. That stubborn, not all in, chips not all in kind of prayer. Here was the prayer that finally changed my life. I said this, God, if you have it, no questions asked, I want it. If it's for me, God, and you have something for me, I'm not going to resist it. I'm not going to fight it. No questions asked, bring it on. If you have it, I need it. Bring it on. I'm going all in. So I want to encourage you guys, let go of your fears and misperceptions. I want to encourage you to go all in. And then finally, I want to encourage you to develop what the Bible calls an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Because that's ultimately what he wants to be in your life, his role in your life. And listen to me, because this is so important for you guys to understand. You guys, God the Father has a role. God the Son, Jesus, has a role to play in your life. And God, the Holy Spirit, has a role, a vital and important role in your life. And there's actually one verse in the Bible where all three people and roles are mentioned. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the very end of that book. It's called a benediction. A benediction is like a closing prayer. There's some beautiful benedictions in the Bible. This is one of them. I'm going to read it to you first in the New King James Version up here on the screen. And then we'll read the message translation, which is in your notes. New King James Version says this, the grace of of the Lord Jesus. Thank God for his grace and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And that's my prayer for you today, that you just understand those roles. Here's what the message translation says. The amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ. I love this. The extravagant love of God and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Here, here's my fear, you guys, that many of us would know the grace of Jesus and even know the love of God, but never have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I desperately want that for you, church. I do. Write these down. Here's the different roles. God the Father loves me. He loves me. And I want to stop right there and settle this, because some of you, you're here today, and you haven't settled this. You need to know. Everyone look up here in my eyes, please. You need to know today, God loves you unconditionally. He loves you. And some of you, you, it's hard for you to relate and even receive that. And and it might be because some of you, you had had a bad relationship with your earthly father, or whoever your parental figure or guardian was that raised you. There There was this, it was a conditional love. Can I tell you something? The reason why um, there was that, that the enemy destroyed your earthly relationship with your father or your guardian or whoever it was, the reason why he destroyed that relationship with your father wasn't just to destroy that relationship on earth. It was, he did that, the enemy did that, so that you would never relate to God, the father, the right way. That's why. And some of you, you, you have this conditional love and you're passing on to your kids conditional love. And they respond to you and you're like, 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 and you need to settle in your heart. Listen, God's not mad at you. He's not mad at you at all. He loves you unconditionally. Yeah, when you do stuff wrong and stuff like that, sure, it, 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 God will get disappointed, but he's not mad. He's not mad at you. It's like when my kids do something wrong. I get a little disappointed, but my heart is drawn even more to them. They never need me more when they're, when they're making missteps and mistakes. I'm drawn, and the Father is drawn to you. He's not repelled by you. He loves you unconditionally. You need to just settle. Some of you need to settle that today, that God loves you. You need to know his love. But Jesus has a role too, that God the Son saves me. 
He saves me. He stepped in and paid the bill. And I, now I don't have to pay it. He went to the cross. He took my sin, my shame, and my guilt. Now I don't have to carry that around anymore. It's paid for. It's canceled. It's gone. So we praise his name. We worship Jesus. And that's where most people's trinity stops. They don't really have a trinity. They have God the Father and God the Son, but they don't know this this last part of God. And that's why I'm saying, give me three more weeks, you guys, and I'll show you how awesome it can be that God the Holy Spirit does not want to freak you out. He just wants to be with you. God the Holy Spirit is with me. He's with me. I want you to be very still for just a moment. Don't tuck your things away just yet. I know I give you your last feeling. But as I was preparing today, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and even gave me like a picture. And I want to share. And God will often do this with me. I don't always share with you what the pictures are and stuff like that. I don't mean to freak you out or anything like that. But, but um, I want to let you know what, 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 what I was experiencing on Friday, studying and praying for you. And I got a picture of someone in a boat. And, and they were trying really hard. Just, just trying. But there was just no, there was no breeze. There was no breath. And, and, and some of you... This is what God told me to tell you. This is, you need this. You need him. And, and some of you, it's life and death. Because some of you are adding even more stress on your, you're trying so hard, but you were never meant. And it's just adding more stress and more problems and more difficulty on your life. There's, there's this colloquialism, the doldrums. And it's, it's the doldrums is, is we say that, oh, so when someone's in the doldrums, they're in like a down place, a low place, like just, they're, they're dull in this lifeless place. But the doldrums is actually a literal place in the ocean. And, and it's, it's right on the equator where the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere winds cancel each other out. And in that space, right on the equator in the ocean, it's, it's called the doldrums. And in that place, there is no wind there. And, and back when they didn't have motorized ships, if you accidentally wandered into the doldrums, you didn't get out. You died there. And some of you have wandered into a Discovery Church today. And inside, you're in the doldrums. And you're trying hard. And this is, this is like life or death for you. You need the breath of God. You need a blast of air. To, you need a, a breath of fresh air to propel you out of that season, out of that situation. You can't do it alone. You were never meant to do it alone. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to breathe on you today. Come on, with that, can we just bow our heads?